Welcome to the Bigfoot Society. In this episode, I talked to Adam Dugan from Small Town Monsters, who shares about the Bigfoot encounter that he and Seth Breedlove had in the infamous Area X of Oklahoma. If you've experienced something similar to what Adam has, or have more information regarding Bigfoot or other cryptids in the same area, please reach out to me immediately after this episode. Remember, your encounter could be the key to unlocking this mystery once and for all, so please don't hesitate to contact me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of talking to an individual that I've wanted to chat with for quite a long time now about some interesting things he's experienced in his past. Adam, how's it going today? It is going well, dude. How are you? I'm doing great. Do uh-huh. you mind sharing a bit about yourself and then I'll let you get right into it. Yeah, that sounds good. So like I said, my name is Adam. I have run around in the woods with Seth Breedlove and Small Town Monsters for the past several years. And only recently did I actually move into a role at STM. So now the COO of STM, which sounds super important, but it just means working really hard with everybody else. But before that, Seth and I became buddies, and if, I'm sure your audience is familiar, but he's the man behind the Small Town Monsters film catalog, YouTube channel, all of that good stuff. And we met in a roundabout way. We both were interested in Bigfoot, uh, and we both liked the same bands. And if Facebook has very rarely done anything productive in my mind, <laughs> but they did, because that's how we connected. I acted in Momo, the Missouri Monster and then in the Jersey Devil movie, and then tagged along with Seth going to look for UFOs up and down the East Coast and several other little excursions. And then the one, probably the biggest one in my mind anyway, was I think what we're going to talk about today, which was getting to go into Area X in uh, Oklahoma with the North American Wood Ape Conservancy a couple of years ago. It was June 16th through the 18th, 2018, which is wild that it was six years ago. It shows you how impactful it was because it feels like it was yesterday. I still remember all of the, the little details that you, know, you only remember when something is a big deal to you. Seth called me randomly one day. We had hung out a little bit beforehand. We had talked a lot about Area X and the North American Wood Ape Conservancy. And the thing that really intrigued me about them was the fact that they had a similar outlook or at least the, the most scientific perspective on Bigfoot that I had heard. I am all in for cryptids and fantastic stories and whatever, but there's a very, there's a very, I don't want to say skeptical, but very critical side, or maybe it's the other way around, not critical, but skeptical of a lot of a lot of things because I'm a human being and some things are just hard to, hard to believe, I guess is the best way to put it. But the NAWAC looked at Bigfoot and I guess still looks at Bigfoot as a flesh and blood creature They're studying it and researching the topic in an attempt to bring it into the scientific community, ultimately for conservation efforts. Because if it is out there, then it is incredibly rare, would be to say endangered would be an understatement, I would think. And in the scientific world, you have to prove its existence with irrefutable evidence to then be able to get the the backing and the support you need to get something on an endangered species list or something like that. So they're a bit controversial in that they, their goal is to uh, get a type specimen. um, So it can officially be documented in the scientific record. Um, They've made it public. They don't want to shoot one. They would much rather find one in one of their research locations that is, had already passed away and then take it and have it. But if given the opportunity, they want to take a type specimen. I was very much in line with how they looked at the creature. So Seth called and said, uh, I remember the conversation. He said, hey, do you want to go to Area X? And I was like, wait, what? You, we can we can do that? Because I listened to the Bigfoot show. So with Brian Brown and with their entire, their entire team, with Daryl Collier, Alton Higgins, listened to them talk about this place and would uh, listen to their stories sitting around what sounded like a, a fire somewhere uh, in the middle of Area X, in my mind, surrounded by Bigfoot and talking about what they had done that day and research projects that they had ongoing. So I had this thing in my head that was built up what this place would look like, you know, just jungle more or less and just in the middle of nowhere. 
And so that, to have the opportunity to actually go see it and put a physical location and a picture into those stories that I heard was just a dream come true. So obviously I said, yes, I live in uh, Southeastern Tennessee and Seth is in Ohio. So he drove down, swung through Nashville, picked me up. It's the first time we'd ever done any like real staying like together in the same place for any extended period of time. We had hung out, but it was always, you know, meeting somewhere in the middle and we'd go eat and talk and whatever else. So our first uh, encounter with each other was uh, in a little car driving from Nashville to Oklahoma. We drove all the way there and met Alton Higgins, who, and I don't know how many of these individuals are still involved or not, and just by my recollection, who, who was involved at the time. So we met him and immediately he took us to essentially what they have is an outpost on the outside of Area X, which I had never heard of. So this was my first like insider baseball thing that I got to see. It's a little outpost on the outside where they would swap teams in and out. So they typically had their research kind of station off the beaten trail, to put it lightly. They had a on the beaten trail place where they would come out, sleep, shower, do whatever. Another team would go in and they'd swap back and forth. So we got to see that place. And then the adventure began. We hopped in Alton's truck. So all of the guys there have trucks that are specifically built to get to this location because it's so buried. It is everything that I imagined it would be and more. I know I heard them describe it as like Jurassic Park, and that is exactly what it looks like. So it was, I don't remember exactly how long. I remember it was a solid, it had to have been 10, 15 miles maybe back into the Washita National Forest and not. 10 or 15 city miles, literally rock crawling to get there. I have video that's playing right now on my iPad, just bouncing around in the back of Alton's truck with Seth up front with a camera per usual. And then me in the back, just like a, a giddy school girl, just being like, I cannot believe this is about to happen. <laughs> so we drove, it took us probably, I, I want to say maybe 45 minutes to an hour or more to rock crawl all the way back in there. Just like I said, 10 miles or so to get back into the area. And so they have a research installation set up. So if you think of a military, if you're familiar with what a FARP is, like a forward operating base or a FOB, I'm sorry, not a FARP, it's another term. But what you would expect, a lot of the guys were former military. And so they had set it up like that. They had built a cabin, a two floor cabin where they could sleep. They had a tower on top of the cabin that with trash bags over the windows so their infrared sights on everything and optics could see but whatever was outside couldn't see in a tin what they called it the hooch which was essentially like a carport more or less but it's where their food was stored underneath anything electronic they didn't need to get wet tables like briefing debriefing tables things like that some other little portable cover where they could sit it gets very hot in Oklahoma in the summer so we got introduced to everything there. And then from that point, kicked off. We were only going to be there two nights actually in at the, in Area X at that current base camp. We just tried to blend in almost like a journalist embedded in a bit of a war zone, like not to make light of war zones. It was not anything like what we did. But in a sense that we had cameras and we were just there along for the ride. We got in there and got a lay of the land. Essentially, like the from the way it was at that point, they would have different, whether it was research projects that were ongoing or just daily activities that would happen every single day. So they might have a research project running. I know they had like fur, fur traps at one point where they had tracker chips and they had these things embedded in trees. So if something tall enough would walk by, this little thing would get embedded in their fur and they would track it. They would also have these daily activities where it would be, yeah, Daryl Collier was former military and just like one of the best people, if you ever have a chance to meet him, one of just the most genuine people you will ever meet, sweet guy, he would go out, he would get in full military camo, full face paint, full camo with like his, like his ghillie suit, if you're familiar with those. So totally covered in what looked like leaves from the terrain itself where we were. And he would go out every day. And I mean, four hours talking, leaving at 10 a.m., and we wouldn't see him again until five or six, like that evening, he'd come back in. 
And he would essentially go out, set up a spot where they had had activity, and he would just bed down and he would be there uh, listening, watching, smelling. He would go out and then he would come back and he would debrief the team when he came back about what had happened. And he also was on walkie communications while he was out as well. And so it just so happened that the first day that we were there, uh, and this is in the documentary that Seth filmed and then edited and then put out afterwards, but Daryl went out and I don't know, I don't remember how long it was that he was out, but all of a sudden we got walkie squawks coming back saying, I see one. I'm looking right at it. Like it's got the dome shaped head. It's a lighter color. I can see its eyes and it's swaying back and forth. It's like moving back and forth. And this is a well-trained former military operator. Like he, he knows how to look through this scope of a that the four or five times optic zoom of a scope, he knows what he's looking at. And you could hear it in his voice. I'm looking at this thing. I am looking at it right now. So that was day one. Seth and I were immediately convinced that we have hit the jackpot. We are here when Bigfoot is going to be proven real. (laughs) It was wild. Like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because it was just like a dream come true. Like all these things I had read, right here they seem to be coming to a point at the place that i had hoped that they would come to a point at and so anyway he watched it for a while and i mentioned them wanting to get a type specimen it's also speaking to their character he was like i couldn't get a good enough shot at it to try and i know that again it sounds harsh to say but a good hunter i grew up in in the south and we all hunt you don't take a shot unless you know that it that you're going to be able to do what you need to do with that shot. You don't want to wound anything. That's that is uh, amateur hour stuff. So he wouldn't take the shot as big of an event, a life changing event as that could have been. He didn't take it, but it was enough for us to hear him describe it while he was looking at it. So obviously we were all very excited, thinking, man, this is this is obviously activity is here. We went on a hike just around the area. And went through one location that, like I said, growing up in the South, what different animals smell, dog and even bear and things like that. We walked through a particular area. There was no no scent, no anything. And then got hit with this odor that smelled like wet dog, but something else that I just wasn't familiar with. Like almost, almost like, I don't know how to describe it. Just a very foul odor. What you would expect what you would think a Bigfoot would smell like, I mean, given the stories. We had that happen fairly soon after we got there. They filled us in on the reports that they had had, the recent activity that they had had. And there was, I don't think I mentioned it, I think there was probably one, two, three, five or six of us there. The members of the NAWAC were staying in the research kind of cabin. Seth and I wanted to, we want, we felt like we needed to prove ourselves. And we were just two, two dudes with cameras just walking around like it's Disney World. So we set up our tent away from the, which plays into the story later, away from the actual installation it, itself a little bit, probably only 100, 150 yards, something like that, if that, but far enough away that we felt like we were out. So if something was to happen, we'd be in the middle of it when it started. We had several things happen that kind of the first couple of hours that we were there. We had some cool conversations with Bob and Kathy Strain sat there and got to talk to them. And we went to bed that night. Nothing really of note happening. Black Widow spider dropping out of the the zipper line of our tent, <laughs> which I have a, a picture of. It was terrifying. Let's see. I, you know, I was an idiot, had food in the tent, and there was some animal rummaging around outside of the tent. Daryl Collier uh, was not happy that I did that, so he let me know. And then, yeah, then we got up the next day and had a pretty, pretty quiet day. There were some wood knocks and some whoops that, that vary like by the book, Bigfoot stuff, but nothing too much. And then the, the high point of the story, we went to bed that night knowing we were leaving early, early-ish the next day. And we'd had cool stuff happen enough that I had really shifted my thoughts on the subject as a whole. And from something I wanted to be real to something that I thought, given how this place looks and what I've heard, the people I've talked to, probably is real. I'd already shifted to there, even just with the things that had happened. But I want to say it's probably Seth and I were in the tent out away from the research cabin. Everybody was in bed. And we, he had a cot on one side of the tent, I had a cot on the other side. And 
I think we were both in that weird state in between awake and asleep. We were just drifting off. And all of a sudden, there was a crash, like an explosion almost, that just echoed in those woods. Just a pow, a real metal, tinny sounding bang. And because you're in those woods like that, it just echoes forever. But it was very close to us. And as soon as that happened, my eyes opened. I'm sure Seth's eyes opened. There came this, I'm, yeah, I'm getting cold chills even thinking about it. There was this, I don't even know how to describe it, whooping monkey. If you've been to like a gibbon exhibit at the zoo where they do the, but more than that laughter almost it almost sounded giddy when it did it and it, i couldn't tell how many different things were making that noise all i know was it was very close it was very loud it was clearly coming from a large animal just the sound was startlingly loud not only the bang but then the whoops that came afterwards and it almost sounded playful like it almost sounded like laughter and people have said since then, owls sound like that. And what, I'm very familiar with what an owl sounds like. Different types of owls. Daryl was talking to owls while we were there. He's the ultimate woods woodsman, woods person. He, was, he would make owl noises and they would respond. And it wasn't, it, it was not an owl because of the, the volume. And also if you just pull up monkey noises at the zoo or like a howler monkey whooping that is exactly what it sounded like, but from something that's lungs were not the size of a traditionally sized howler monkey or gibbon or whatever we're familiar with. And I don't know if Seth remembers this and because it, it all happened so quickly, but there was also some rustling, clattering, like some other almost like movement in the brush uh, up behind in the direction of the research cabin. So if we were you know, if you look at like a, a compass, we were south of the cabin. And so then the cabin was obviously north of us. And then behind the cabin further was a hill that ran up into who knows where. We had hiked up there, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly where it went. But it sounded like the rustling and all of that was happening up on that end of it. And the clearest thing I remember is Seth half asleep, sitting up and saying something like, oh, it's happening. We both at that moment, it, it just made me laugh so hard. We talked about it on the way back, on the drive back to Nashville, that just the, just all of these emotions at one time, like, wow, what is that? And your brain immediately tries to recognize the sound. And, you know, you're just going through your Rolodex of animal sounds, wood sounds, forest sounds. And I kept clicking back to monkey. I remember that, like, why am I trying to convince myself that I didn't just hear a monkey? Like, I'm an adult. I've heard monkeys. I know what they sound like. That's what that sounded like, pure and simple. And I would try to, you know, it flashes all right then in that moment. It was uh, bird, no, owl, no. Uh, then you go into these weird things that you also know or shouldn't be there. Uh, jackal, hyena. Like you start running through these things trying to match up noises. And I kept going back to... Uh, going back to like a, a gibbon or a howler monkey or something like that, that just is the long extended whoops and then a cackle afterwards. Coyote, it wasn't a coyote, clearly. And so we we jumped up. The guys in the cabin had, had already fallen asleep. I think we were up significantly later than them. I remember members of the cabin that were that were in the cabin opening the door and coming out and we were looking, we were talking to them on the walkie talkie. They were all fumbling out of the cabin door in various states of awakeness. Cause I think we were all just startled because uh, it came out of nowhere. Everything settled down after that. We got up the next morning and tried to put the puzzle pieces together. And essentially what we came to the conclusion that something that was up on the hill, which is somewhere that they typically would see these things where they would come up, from behind the hill, come down, observe them from up on top. And if they needed to get back, whatever it is, could get back up to the safety of the hill and over whatever beyond, was beyond that hill. And on top of the hooch that I mentioned earlier, the big 10 kind of carport, 
there was a large rock that was up on top of that, up on top of the hooch, which then made sense that if something is up there, they're watching, we're asleep, there are rocks, all kinds of stuff on this hill that just climbs up for a good ways behind the cabin. It sounded to me, something was up there watching. Everyone had settled down. Seth and I were finally going to sleep and drifting off. No more movement. It picks up a rock and just does that thing that you see gorillas do. They throw stuff, poop or otherwise, they throw stuff. And it hit that, that hooch. It made a loud noise. And what I interpreted as whooping and whatever sounded, like I said, like giddiness, almost like, oh, we did it. That was a cool noise we made. We were trying to throw something in that direction. Look what we did. And then the shuffling, rustling, all of that stuff, scampering back up as they realized, oh, that was a real loud noise. We're not hidden at this very moment and we need to get back. We had that that event happen along with the other events, along with being able to corroborate that with a finding something that would have made that noise and then putting those pieces together, whether or not that was the intention of whatever it was, I don't know. Um, But to me anyway, it sounded like a giant playful ape of some kind that had surprised itself with its, with its accuracy, with a rock, enjoyed the noise and then realized, Oh, we got to get out of here because we just gave ourselves away. And that was the, that was the turning point for sure for me in my journey anyway to actually believing that Bigfoot is a thing exactly what it is I still don't know unfortunately I didn't see it but I feel like I was as close as anyone has been that I've heard with as much was I don't even want to say proof as much evidence to support the story given surrounding situations and what we found afterwards as anyone I've heard I called my dad on the way back and I told him because it's a big deal. He got me into the Bigfoot subject. And that's been something we've connected over since I was really little. It was just weird, strange things, cryptid, paranormal, whatever. And I called him and I was like, I I think I just said they're real. Like it's a real thing. So yeah, so that was, that's my story. That's my Bigfoot story. And I think I've looked at the subject different since that day and in a lot of different ways, no closer to an exact explanation of what Bigfoot is. But I had one of those encounters that you hear about on podcasts. And despite your best efforts, can't help but doubt a little bit when you hear them. Because you just, it wasn't you that had that experience personally. And then all of a sudden it was me. And here I am telling someone on a cool podcast about my story and thinking all the people probably sitting out there, the same thoughts that I used to have about that. I don't know. It sounds like a cool story, but I wasn't there. So that's my Bigfoot encounter. Adam, that's an incredible account. I think it's actually referred to in Michael May's book as well, Valley of the Apes. It's shortly mentioned, I, I believe, that you guys okay. were there, which is pretty cool. Oh, cool. That, I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would just check that out, that book out for sure. There's a lot of interesting things that that you mentioned. One was how your your almost paradigm shifted and you got to the point where you're like, okay, I really believe in these creatures now for sure. When you heard that in the tent, and I've experienced this myself in Iowa, and I'll Mm -hmm. get into this in the future, but I I know exactly what that's like to be in a tent and then to experience something like that. What emotions were going through uh, your mind? Was it hard for you to get back to sleep? Uh, Yeah, that's a good question because it was really strange how... You would think, you know, you listen to these podcasts and, 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 and you hear people's encounters and they say, like, I was terrified. I was just absolutely terrified. I was, all I wanted to do was turn and run and I never want to go back in the woods and whatever. And I know that my, my encounter is not nearly as traumatic as what I think some people have, I've heard some people talk about. My, past the initial shock of I'm going to sleep and all of a sudden I'm awake with a loud noise was straight adrenaline, number one. And then number two, I, in a very like childlike way, there was almost this, I'm trying to think the best way to put it because I've not really ever thought about it, what the emotion would be. Almost like a euphoric moment where it's, oh my gosh, there's more stuff out there than I realized. Because I think you always want to, you know, I've said this on 
uh, in a lot of different places, talking to different people, both personally and professionally. Like as, as human beings, we're very arrogant. We like to think that we know how everything works. We know what's up in the sky and what's under the water. We know what's in the in the woods. And all of a sudden to have that paradigm change just yeah. like in an instant and think, okay, all of those things that I had bought into more or less as an arrogant human being myself, they just changed. Everything just flipped. And it was adrenaline, excitement to say the least. And then it moved on to how, now what? Do I, do we unzip this tent and stick our heads straight out without, <laughs> without assessing the situation? Do we radio into the guys that are in the cabin and ask them what to do? Because we had gone over several different kind of like SOPs, some standard operating like procedures about what to do if, but this was not covered what to do if you're asleep and all of a sudden what seems like a Bigfoot invades your camp, throws a rock, starts chattering. What is, we didn't have an SOP for that. So part of me also was like, okay, don't make an idiot of yourself. These guys are all former military, just like the kind of people you'd want to be stuck in the woods with if you had to be stuck. So don't make an idiot of yourself. And what could be literally 10 feet outside my tent right now? Could that be? Could Bigfoot be right there? Could all the proof that everyone's been looking for since before the Patterson-Gimlin film, is it right there? So I don't know even how to describe the emotion other than just pure excitement and whatever the emotion of a complete shift in your even worldview, <laughs> like well, how you see things. I don't know what that emotion is, but that's what I was, that's what I was feeling anyway. It, it is the weirdest thing. It's very hard to explain unless you've experienced yourself. If you could go back and live through that night again, what things would you do differently? Yeah, I think what I didn't do at that time, I think Seth and I have even talked about this from just a pure proof perspective. I wish that we had something running while we were sleeping that night. This That wasn't anything that had been reported, at least not regularly or recently, as far as that kind of activity like you in the middle of the night. And you're in the middle of the woods. We can't do a lot as far as what we came with, what was charged, what was ready beyond some battery packs and stuff. We had finite resources. So we were trying to be a bit stingy with those. So if it wasn't something that we were actively trying to film, it wasn't an interview or just generic b-roll walking around to area x we didn't have cameras going all the time or recorders going that would have been one thing i think that obviously having a recorder going so then i could myself selfishly could go back and listen to it whenever i wanted to but also have that to share with people to get their feedback but to also validate you know what we heard um, that would be something and then i think and it probably was that discretion was the better part of valor there. We didn't go charging off into the woods, chasing whatever this thing was. But I think there was hesitation. There's a lot of hesitation, at least on my part initially, of what to do next and how best to cement that experience because it had already, it had already passed by the time we realized what had happened. And so I think there probably would have been some things immediately going and starting to poke around behind the cabin and get up on the hill a little bit. But it was almost sh shock, not in a negative way, but just something that was completely unexpected. And so there was, you don't know what you do in those situations until you're in them, especially one like that, where you don't really ever even plan on being in it. It's not, what if you're in a, uh, a fast food restaurant and somebody has a heart attack? You know what to do in that situation. It's unexpected, but there's precedent. There was just no precedent in my mind for this. And so it was, yeah, so I think it, long answer short, probably would have spared or would have went ahead and used some additional battery power, knowing it was our last night to have something recorded. And then probably would have dug around a little bit more afterwards instead of just stood there for the next, stood, sat, laid there, whatever, for the next hour with my jaw on the floor. I would love to go back and not necessarily chase the creature, but chase the event a little bit further just to see what clues might be left behind more so than what we saw 
because obviously things were left behind a bit with what we found on the roof of that the hooch the next morning. So that, I probably those are the things that immediately come to mind. Did you find yourself having a internal struggle when it came to? Am I an observer or am I someone that's here affecting what's going on? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think that I think that there was already a bit of like almost imposter syndrome a little bit being there because I hadn't contributed to any of the the research. I, I hadn't done anything to put all of us in the situation that we were in to have that kind of experience. There was, but it was also something to the fact that it was known that changes in the team that were in Area X at a given time, new people introduced, people leaving, different voices, different morning routines for people getting up. These guys would go in, guys and girls would go in and stay for a week at a time, two weeks at a time. I believe one went and was, it might have been, I don't remember who it was, but someone went in and stayed for a month alone. So when changes would happen in these morning routines of different team members in and out, when those would change, it would cause the whatever it is, the creature's behavior to change. And so part of it also is it was interesting to me thinking that maybe Seth and my presence there being a new presence have incited some of that activity a little bit, which was a kind of a cool thought to think that maybe we did have a part in this. But really what it felt like to me was something that an animal would do to to walk right up to the the cliff's edge of interaction with something that it was curious about. So whether we influenced it or we're just observers, I think it was a bit of both. I think we were influencing an animal to do what it would naturally do uh, if it was curious about something that it didn't understand or something that was out of the norm for it being there. So I think we observed a natural behavior, but we might have piqued the curiosity uh, that was required to incite that behavior, maybe. What if Daryl had taken the shot and got the target while you guys were there? Is that something you've ever thought about? Oh, yeah. We not only we think about it, we were, I keep using military terms because that's, I'm a military aviation nerd. Okay. And I, yeah, I'm a, yeah, I won't even go into that. But so I keep thinking about that, but we were briefed on what, what would happen. There's discipline in their approach to the entire subject, which is what attracted me, like I said, in the first place. The scientific method, not liking what they were there to do necessarily, but knowing that ultimately, like it, it for the betterment of whatever this species is. So we were, the general consensus was that if there was a type specimen taken, that most likely it would be a member of a family group, something like that. They had observed young, old, bigger, smaller ones during their years there, that probably you would have repercussions from whatever of the other members of that kind of clan or family group. You would be a, a target immediately. And so before we went out the first time, we were told if this happens and things get wild, Adam, you're here with this team. Seth, you're here with this team. You guys are in this truck. You guys are in this truck. This is a meeting point if you get lost. You need to make sure so-and-so is Adam's like watchdog, essentially. If you make sure he doesn't, don't let him out of your sight. So when your your sets, here's if we can only, if we don't have time to get the entire specimen out, here's prime piece of documentation that we can get. Here's secondary, here's tertiary. Here's our order of importance as far as triaging a situation. So we were even told like, where to go, what to do, what to say, how quickly to get there. If that doesn't work, what's the next option and who you should be with at all times. Yeah, we were told it was essentially going to be like a mass exodus to get back to that cabin that was established outside of the actual forest, back towards civilization, where then there were things set up there to make sure that whatever was taken care of until whoever they needed to contact could be contacted and, and whatnot. And they didn't give, that, those were not details they gave us as far as who was lined up and ready. I believe that they had some, some professors and scientists from the University of Oklahoma that they knew and whether they could say it publicly or not, believed in what they were doing and were willing to 
get there to make sure that the appropriate measures were taken, that whatever was taken was preserved well and was handled in a way that couldn't be discredited once it was actually brought to light. So yeah, they had a very definitive protocol for what to do at that point. That's so interesting. And all that is not, that has been talked before about before. So Adam isn't throwing anything into the open that shouldn't be. Listeners, I'll have the link to Wide Open Research, the episode with Daryl Collier. And he goes uh, deep into what's called the Artemis Protocol, uh, which is mm-hmm. what's being referred to there. What happens if they do get the type specimen and then what are the next steps? So that's an interesting right. listen. I would recommend people go there next after this. How was the ride back to Tennessee different than the ride in <laughs> <to> Oklahoma? <laughs> It was, we were sleep deprived, especially from the night before. We were still in bewilderment a little bit. We just, like I said, we, you have this fundamental change in how you look at things. And we both, I think, tried to play skeptic on one another. We both tried to more, I think, present all the arguments that we expected to hear. Because you're thinking, I want to tell everyone. How do I answer the questions when they start asking these questions? Like, how do almost coming up with your arguments, your defense against arguments that you know are coming and criticism that you know is coming. There was a lot of that. I don't remember being tired at all. I I remember sitting there and thinking, we are talking about this fundamental shift in this, this guy who's now become my, you know, my best buddy. But at the time we had, we, we didn't know each other super well, but we had just had this experience together relating to this subject that we had both just been in love with since we were little and having those discussions, lots of excitement, like I said, lots of questions, answering each other's questions, trying to fill in gaps in the story that one of us maybe didn't remember as well because of being half asleep at the time and then waking up more fully and both paying attention to different things and trying to piece that puzzle together. I know, like I said, I called my dad. He called he called his dad. I think that was the first time I'd ever heard his dad. And since since then, I've gotten to I've gotten to spend a lot a lot of time with his dad and, and his mom bef- before she passed away. And just hearing his dad's excitement in response to Seth's excitement was so cool because it was it was like just a mirror of my dad and I, and how like it, it said there's a a lot more to the to that whole moment than just I think we just heard Bigfoot. It was like I got something to share with my dad and I've listened to podcasts since I was little, you know, read books and then eventually what radio programs or whatever and to podcasting and talked about all these encounters. And we posed our for and against arguments for these encounters and all of this stuff. And all of a sudden I was telling my dad mine and Seth was telling his dad his. And there's something really special about that. But the, but the ride back was just excited uh, in a way that I don't think I've been excited. I just remember thinking like, oh, I'm one of those people now. Like I've been listening to these people talk about their Bigfoot experiences on podcasts and read books about them and whatever. Oh my gosh, like I'm one of them. <laughs> it was good, and not in a negative way at all, in a very positive way. Like I almost like you got to, yeah, you know, like you said, you've had experiences like you get to join a, a group of, of pe- people you wanted to joined for a long time, but really you never really expected to be in that cool club. So it was just a very excited ride back. Lots of talking and recounting the story as we remembered it and putting puzzle pieces together. And not only that, but I, I think in the community, there's definitely this this like aura, this sense of awe when people hear about Area X or talk about Area X. There's just something mm-hmm. about it. And Have you ever thought, why do you think there's such a sense of awe about this one particular place in Southeast Oklahoma, as opposed to Mm -hmm. fill in the blank with random area in Tennessee, Mm -hmm. which could have Mm -hmm. just as crazy things happening? Yeah, I, I think a lot of that can be attributed to, I've always thought that Brian Brown, who had the Bigfoot show back in the day, I always thought he was such a good, uh, such a good storyteller. He did such a good job of describing the location and making it seem real and alive, even if you weren't there. Did a great job. He and the guys on the on that podcast talking about the experiences that they had and also making I think there was a separation with that place and some other places because of the group of people that were there. 
And just the inherent credibility I always felt like they had just listening to them talk and explain their backgrounds. And I always had this thought that they're obviously smarter than I am. I can listen to them talk and tell that they've got more going on upstairs than I do. And they're this bought into it. They're smart enough to run these research projects to do these things. These are grown men that have had great careers, whether academic careers or military careers, all very skilled in their various kind of areas of expertise. And they're there because they they believe that this is this is something worth somewhere worth being. And just wanting to see that place that people like that think is worth exploring. I think that was I think that was a big part of it just because it was this mythical place and still is to me. It hasn't lost any of that. Being there further reinforced that belief that there's something special about that area in and of itself. And I think even more than that, having been there now, the way it was described as Jurassic Park as just a jungle in the middle of the United States, like that kind of thing. And then seeing it and being like, oh, that's a very accurate description of this place. It was weird. It, it, there is something about it, and I don't know what it is. And I think Seth would say the same thing. There's something about that place that feels different without going like too deep into it. I've struggled with real bad anxiety my entire life and had some real down moments with that. And removing, I had no cell phone access. I had, because of how isolated this place was, I had no, nobody knew me from anybody in there. It was all a group of people that were interested in the same subject who could not communicate with the outside world. And really the only communication they had was with each other and interacting with whatever else is out there in that place. Something about that, I remember being so, I don't know, at peace is the right word, almost like leaving it, you felt you could tell you were going. And I still remember like that feeling of just no, not a care in the world because you were right there, like in that moment and being truly like in the moment, which is very difficult to do, I think, in just today's world to just be present where you are with the people you're with doing the thing that you're doing. And so I don't know if that answers the question, but only that I think that there's just something to that place in general, whether it's the stories or the isolation or a combination of both, but it's just a, it's just a special place that's hard to describe unless you've just buried yourself in those podcasts and the stories that come from there. And then on top of that, if you ever have had or have an opportunity to go into there, I think that's the only way it actually makes sense to, to understand how my, it might be different than some other places that have as much or more activity that don't have quite the same impact. I love that answer because it's absolutely true. That whole situation has such a cast of characters. You can really get into the information that's available about it through different ways, through Michael May's book. The NAWAC website has audio you can listen to. There's multiple podcasts over the years that have hours and hours of content. You can really get involved with the universe as it was, as it were, when it comes mm -hmm. to Area X. It's pretty wild to think about. Is the, the book of STM involvement with Area X, is that closed or could there perhaps be another chapter written in the future on it? I think that there, I think that there was actually talk of Seth and I making a return visit. I think initially we had thought it might have been this last summer going back out there. And the, the group is different now than when we were there. There have been some members for one reason or another who have left the group and are pursuing the same subject, but in a different way or in a different area, new leadership, I think in the organization with the same overall goal as at least how I understand it. So I wouldn't, I would not never say never. I know that if given the opportunity, Seth and I would hop in the car tomorrow and make the same trek. So I wouldn't say never, but I would say that if that was the first and last and only chapter of STM's journey in the Area X, I would say it was a darn good chapter. And I can't imagine it have being any better than what it than what it was. Sans the no audio recording and whatever and the questions that come along with that. But I never say never. I know I would go back. I know Seth would if given the opportunity to. Um, who knows? Who knows? I know that's a tricky question to 
to ask and to receive, but man, just throwing it out there since you're COO. Oh, if I can make it happen. <laughs> Dude, uh, it'd be cool to I get can, Alex or Eli in there. <laughs> oh, no, no joke. I'll send flowers to whoever. They'll let me back in there. Give me the address. I'll send them Applebee's gift cards, whatever they want. <laughs> After you went through that situation in Area X and you said you're from Southeast Tennessee, did this lead mm -hmm. to you going out and doing any research on your own or any other similar situations going into Bigfoot areas? Yeah, I think what it did was make me realize that Oklahoma is not a place that traditionally you associate with Bigfoot. If it wasn't for Area X, if it wasn't for what I know because of Area X and the history, pretty story history that Oklahoma has in the world of Bigfoot, I wouldn't have just thought off the top of my head. So what it caused me to do was to reassess what I considered to be like a feasible location for Bigfoot, which then caused me to reassess, like I said, Southeast Tennessee, we, we're, I'm right here close to the Cherokee National Forest. There are Bigfoot stories that were over the years turned into paranormal stories surrounding the Chickamauga battlefield, which was obviously more isolated than it used to be prior to the Battle of Chickamauga and the Civil War, and now it being a, a big tourist place to go. It was there there are stories there that involved something that people that soldiers were seeing and they attributed it to a ghost. But when you listen when you read the stories, it's a Bigfoot story. There are other places close to very close to me that I would have normally said, well, we don't have Bigfoot here, whatever. It's Tennessee. We don't have, you know, we don't have, especially in these locations that I'm thinking of, we, that's not, that's, that just doesn't make sense or whatever. And then knowing that Bigfoot doesn't care. Bigfoot is where, where Bigfoot is. It doesn't care about state lines or anything. It cares about finding a place for that point in time where it can stay as reclusive as it needs to be to survive and have enough food to do so. And then move on. So wherever that might be. So I think it opened up my eyes to the idea that's possible, whereas before maybe I wouldn't have even entertained it. And so, yeah, I, I, since then, I have definitely gone into the woods more specifically with the intent on or not being closed off to the idea of having some sort of encounter and also just gone into the woods more in general because the woods all of a sudden had a different aura to it regardless of where it was because of just the, po the possibility of something being there and when your fundamental view on what's possible changes then all of a sudden like everywhere looks like like a place to explore with unknown unknown findings just waiting for you once you get in there and dig around so in a roundabout way it made almost i think every trip going into the woods an opportunity to relive that moment in in one way or another i think so yeah i've definitely i've always been in the woods i've always enjoyed being outside and doing outdoor things and hiking and climbing and that kind of stuff but it takes on a different thing especially when you have a kid i remember when my little boy was younger he's 11 now but when he was younger we'd go in the woods we'd hear something fall and we both stop and look around and I could tell what was going through his mind, even though he wouldn't say it out loud. And it just made me happy. All of a sudden, I had that sense of wonder that I was seeing. And at the time, he was, gosh, he was probably five or six. When I'm thinking back, like we were both in the same place at that moment. Me, the dad, and him, the kid, just like my dad and I did. Something moves in the woods, and all of a sudden, your first thought isn't squirrel or raccoon. It's what if that, what if something's watching us? What if there's, what if it's right here? And so I've encouraged that since then too with him. So it's led to a lot of fun times in the woods for sure. Oh, that's great. That That is so cool that you're able to in, involve your kid like that. It's very important. I feel <laughs> that we do that as parents. The first thought, thank you so much for sharing what you experienced yeah. in Area X. It's, it's fantastic. We had talked about Momo for a second and I don't want to miss talking about that for a little bit. Do you have any funny behind the scenes stories about the whole Momo experience? Because there are some interesting oh, people there. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there was some cool stuff. There's, I was talking to Heather Moser the other day on, uh, on her, uh, the Lore you know, podcast. And she asked 
something about a, a a story from a film or or something like that, like a behind the scenes thing. And Momo had several of them. I think just because the the nature of the way that Seth wanted to wanted to make that movie, it being part campy narrative, part documentary, which is super interesting to be able to blend those two. It lent itself to a lot of opportunities for just uh, overacting or underacting or acting in a way that you imagine someone would back at the time that supposedly the series that was presented as Lyle Blackburn series back in the 70s, how those actors would be. So there was interacting with the, with Ken, who was in the big, in the Momo costume, interacting with him was funny because the costume was intentionally campy and not realistic, but very cool. There was, we all stayed at least just a crew and then a couple of the crew slash actors, myself and the kids who were in the movie all stayed in a similar location, if not in the house where we shot a lot of it. And I went in one day. I think it was to I think it was to use the restroom maybe, but went into one of the bedrooms in the house into the bathroom and opened the door and it was hot and there was Ken half in the Bigfoot costume and the smell was horrendous, just terrible. And that's not Ken. That's being in a Momo costume for hours and hours in ninety degree heat and just the juxtaposition of this guy who I believe he's a semi-professional wrestler. So he's huge standing there in half of a Bigfoot costume, like looking just woefully at me, like, I'm so hot, dude. I'm so, I'm so hot. <laughs> it just, it was just a comical moment, just like a snapshot of that moment. Oh, this is what independent filmmaking looks like. This is not Hollywood. This is weird. Like, we're working all within a, a budget and we're all in the same place and it's real hot. And we're sh- the guy playing the me playing Edgar, the dad who's having these Momo encounters just happens to open the bedroom door because you need to go to the bathroom. And there's Momo, half Momo with a large semi-professional wrestler in the costume looking like he's getting ready to pass out from dehydration and just looking like, dude, I, I get it. That's awesome. This is, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's just, I'm all about those moments that are just like comical in a very twisted way. Uh, so that was, and Ken's a, Ken is a sweet guy. He's a, he was a lot of fun to be around. That kind of thing happened pretty regularly. There was a car in the movie. There was a, Seth actually bought a vintage Volkswagen Beetle just for that movie. And I want to say he still has it in storage somewhere. It's a, such a cool car. But having to push that thing down to the area we needed it to be to film the scene and just trying to, the tires spinning in mud, obviously a Volkswagen Beetle, unless you are not using it for its intended purpose, is not an off-road vehicle. So it didn't like that too much. You know, getting that thing stuck and then pushed back out and, you know, dealing with, it start raining and we'd all pile into the, to the Beetle to stay dry that kind of stuff that I don't know. It was very cool to be a fly on the wall. Like just said, I'm not acting in every scene. And mm. so just to be able to watch just everybody scramble to make this independent film uh, and everybody there really, nobody's getting rich doing this, just doing it because just love the subject and want to make something cool for other people to watch too. So yeah, there were a lot of things like that. Yeah. Th- those are great stories. Thank you for sharing a little bit behind the scenes. There's very cool stuff. I've been a fan of STM for years and there would, I can almost hundred percent say there'd be no Bigfoot society without the influence of STM just cause it, it had that much of an influence. That's really cool. Um, and that's, also that's so cool to hear. I was involved with Andrew Peterson filming the interviews for terrors in the sky tear in the skies. And he had me do the questions off camera for the interviews. And it was halfway during that interaction that I realized that I love in interviewing people and that, Hey, I, I should just start a podcast and see what happens. It literally yeah, yeah, did yeah. really help me out. That's so cool. 
But I want to make sure that we let's take a few minutes. There's something special going on with STM right now. You guys got you have the Kickstarter going on right now. And uh, mm-hmm. I think it's a really important if you could share what's going on with that and what STM has coming up in the next year and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't want to make this a big like advertisement or anything, but it does tie in like directly with everything that we, we were talking about. It Every year, Small Town Monsters does a Kickstarter campaign essentially to help fund projects like Momo, like the On the Trail of Bigfoot series, which the, the time that we spent in, in Area X was a part of that. There's a campaign every year. Essentially, what we do is say, here are the movies that we have. We go ahead and begin to produce some of the content artwork, things like that. And then we have a big live stream and we have people who have joined us over the years and watched the company grow along with me. Like I'd still, I'm still a fan of small town monsters. I'm still a fan of Seth Breedlove and the movies and whatever. So I was right there too, several years ago and still am just watching, Oh, what are they going to do this year? (laughs) And give people an opportunity to help us fund these projects. If it's something that they're enjoying and subjects that I think are Sometimes it's difficult to find new stuff on. We'll have a Kickstarter campaign where essentially people get on and will donate a certain amount of money to help us fund it, to fund these films, and in return, get all kinds of, uh, at the very least, get the movies when they come out. And then up to, if somebody really wants to help out, can be an executive producer, a producer or an executive producer in the movie and have names and credits, get limited edition poster art from the movies that are coming out. Gene St. Jean has done these this crazy cool collection. So he creates these statues that are, I mean, are literally, it's art of these kind of creatures throughout the years that are featured in the Small Town Monsters movies. And they're exclusive to the STM movies. So you can purchase, you know, statues from him that are, you know, just generic, really cool kind of cryptids but then specific limited runs that are made for small town monsters themselves in return for helping us out with those things. You get some tiers, we'll get access to those and then have them just delivered straight to you. And then also maybe most importantly, just knowing that all of that goes to helping us make these movies that I think we've all enjoyed, regardless of your small town monsters staff or somebody that's just discovered it, like movies that we all like and we all want to see more of. And so every year it's gotten bigger and grown. And we've become more ambitious with what we'd like to do. And I think at this point, we're, we're doing things that we had always heard that ourselves and those interested in the subject wanted to see, but just wasn't out there. We've gotten to a point now where we can actually just start making those for everyone and selfishly for ourselves too. So that just started. That started, we had the kickoff was on the 2nd of February and we had a big party um, where we had some giveaways and things like that. And then the campaign itself actually runs through the end of February. So it runs, I believe it's exactly 30 days. I, I think it ends on the 2nd of March where you can still, you can continue to donate. You don't have to attend the live stream essentially to, to benefit from all the different levels of, of rewards and tiers. So we have, like I said, a limited run posters of all the movies. So this year we have, um, we also have hoodies and t-shirts that are done several different designs with the creatures from the movies by Jonathan Dodd. Did some really cool artwork for us there. We have a uh, statue of Goatman, which is one of the movies this year, which is a really obviously unique cryptid. Difficult to find content on Goatman unless you really know where to look. So we're going to change that. And then like I said, obviously supporting the films and getting your name in the credits and copies of all of the movies, physical and digital copies, things like that. So that's that's what's going on right now. So this is the biggest month of us for the month for us of the entire year. This is really where we know what we're going to be able to produce and, and put out for people over the next year or two, really. Oh, absolutely. And it's like the way I look at it is another thing I really like is I loved when the Mandalorian was coming out from Disney plus. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I'm a subscriber of Disney plus because I want Disney to come out with more Mandalorian. It's the same right. way. If you like what yeah. small town monsters has come out with in the past, 
this is a way for you to make the stuff keep coming. And also you mentioned how it's hard to find Goatman stuff, right? The thing I like mm-hmm. about STM is that you're making content about things that might not be out there. For example, you're coming out with a documentary on the land between the lakes, mm-hmm. uh, Dogman, and part of the Kickstarter is you're able to get the hardcover book from Aaron Deese about the yes. Dogman the LBL. And that is just, it's a very cool thing. It's really cool. I think that's another piece that I don't want to like gloss over. A lot of the content you find as far as book wise about these subjects is a bit older now. There's a few newer ones, but a lot of it's a bit older or you're looking at digital copies of it, things like that. We are a fan of physical things. I think we're all just a bit nostalgic. So part of the Kickstarter is, is like you said, hardcover versions of Aaron's book about Land Between the Lakes. Another big Thing, just throwing it out there while I'm thinking about it. Maybe one of the biggest announcements I think that we made is Small Town Monsters is going to have a uh, television channel called Unexplained TV, where we're going to get to just go wild and dig deep into a bunch of topics that we've not gotten to look at yet or look further into some that we have dug into. And it's not directly associated with the Kickstarter, but the Kickstarter definitely makes those projects possible to make sure that we have the resources to create new content to go on those platforms. And and this TV channel is going to be free to everyone. And it's going to be a place where you're going to get to say, oh, hey, Wednesday is Werewolf Wednesday. Like we all love Dogman Werewolf stuff. Like Wednesdays at eight o'clock, the family sits down and we watch Unexplained TV because they've got uh, a werewolf documentary on, a Dogman documentary on. It's going to be, you know, made possible by the Kickstarter. And we're not saying, hey, give us money and enjoy the stuff. We're saying, hey, help us make this stuff and let us give you some cool stuff in return, which I think is really cool. Like you said, if you like this kind of content and you want to consume it, like you like a TV show or a streaming service that creates a piece of content that you like, it's great if you can help support that creator and allow them to make more of those things that you like because we contrary to what a lot of people think and small town monsters has done a great job of positioning itself as like a kind of a an innovator in this little weird space that we all love so much but we're still a small company and just trying to make stuff that we understand that people who are interested in these things like too, like us. So it's a huge, it's a huge help. It really is like a community company. It's so important that we have the support to do what we, to do what we need to do. I know that probably sounds like a sales pitch. I, it's really coming from the heart though. It's a labor of love for all of us. And like I said earlier, none of us are getting rich off of it. We just want to make cool stuff that we want to watch ourselves. I also wanted to make sure since we're talking about STM stuff that we'd spend a few minutes talking about Monster Fest 2, which you guys did chat a lot about during the kickoff that you guys had. Um, If listeners don't know, Monster Fest 2 is coming up in beautiful Canton, Ohio. It's a way where you can listen to podcasts live, speakers. I'll be there doing a live podcast, Bigfoot Society. And do you mind talking a few minutes about that, Adam? No, absolutely not. Last year, we had our inaugural Monster Fest. Again, coming from the, the... what sounds like a selfish place of wanting to create like a, a con that, that had the speakers and the activities and the opportunities that we enjoy, not only as people that are in this world, but also people who love this community itself. And there are a lot of good ones out there, but we tried to look at our audience and the people that have been supporting us and what would they like to see? We're all big fans of podcasts and we're all big fans of Bigfoot Society. Obviously, wouldn't it be cool to have to have the Bigfoot Society do a podcast live from an event from some from somewhere and be able to attend that? Wouldn't it be cool to have the guys from Astonishing Legends do a, a live podcast? Where do I get cool Bigfoot stuff? Like where do I, I can't how do I go find a a cool t-shirt with Bigfoot on it that I can't, is unique. How do I, where do I learn to cast a Bigfoot track? What if I found one? Where do I learn to better charge my batteries so I can catch Bigfoot like howling at night when I'm in Oklahoma? <laughs> like all of these cool things. And uh, beyond that, a place where every, where you can do that with other people who appreciate all of it as well. So we had this event last year that was a small town monsters event that we put on that 
uh, I don't want to say surprisingly, but did surprisingly well for the first year. The feedback was great, not only from people who were there as vendors and speakers, but people who just attended to uh, see the family again, more or less, be able to be around like-minded people. So it was such a big event, such a great success, especially for a first year. We immediately had people asking, what about next year? When is it next year? And we decided we need to do another one then. That one was so good. So this year, it is, like you said, it's in, in Canton, Ohio. So it is going to be June 28th and 29th. So on the 28th, there is a premiere film at the Cannes Palace Theater. And then the following day is an all-day event in downtown Canton, where we'll have, like I said, uh, live podcasts, vendors with unique stuff that you're not going to see anywhere else as far as Bigfoot and Mothman and Dogman and uh, a lot of just guests in general. So you're going to be there, which I'm very excited about. We're going to have, I believe, Lyle Blackburn is going to be there. Like I mentioned, the guys from Astonishing Legends are going to be doing a live podcast there. If you go to Small Town Monsters Instagram page, you'll see we've dropped the, the guests that are going to be there throughout the last couple of months. It is like a coming home for all of us that are dispersed throughout the country <laughs> to come together and have a lot of fun over a couple of days and just talk about the stuff that we're interested in that maybe we don't get to talk about very often. Because like I said, we're a unique little group, but but a, but a strong group nonetheless. So yeah, so that's that's June in Canton. And there's information on smalltownmonsters.com about that. Like I said, the Instagram page, you can see a lot about that there, along with guest lists and things like that. You can book rooms at our hotel in Canton, but there's a block of rooms that are reserved for for us there. And it actually takes place there at the hotel's convention area center. Like I said, we're going to do casting clinics this year, along with a couple of other things. We'll have food, food trucks. Yeah, so it's a good time. So this will be year number two. Year number one was a great success. So this year we'll hopefully step that up even another level. It's a super exciting event. And you want to make sure in case stuff changes after this interview, you go to smalltownmonsters.com and then there's a Monster Fest page that has all the current info. But the thing that I found was even to tag on even more, what happened last year when I was there was the people I met that I thought I would never meet were incredible. I met people like Les Odell, Robert W. Morgan was there signing his books. And it was just, it made for these incredible interactions that were just like such a, an incredible benefit to going to the actual fest itself. It's a really cool time. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a ton of fun. If nothing else, come hang out at the Small Town Monsters booth and help me hand out t-shirts. <laughs> it was wild last year, but in, in the best way. It was a, a ton of fun. Absolutely. Oh, it's a good time. Adam, I'm so uh, thankful we were able to get you on and to chat about what happened to you guys in Area X. Such a fun conversation today. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, dude, absolutely. I really appreciate it. Do you mind in the last few minutes taking a minute to remind listeners how they can keep up to date with what uh, Small Town Monsters is doing? Yeah, for sure. We are pretty much going to be on any social media platform that you want to jump on. I'd say that probably the biggest, most active one is going to be Instagram. If you just look for Small Town Monsters on Instagram, we will be there. We do lots of little lives there along with just updates on projects and things. Uh, Facebook is the same way. Uh, Smalltownmonsters.com is going to be the hub for everything and will at least get you where you need to go if you're not sure where to go. And then specifically right now, obviously, the Kickstarter. Uh, If you go to kickstarter.com and if you search for Small Town Monsters, and then you'll soon be able to find us on a bunch of different platforms with Small Town Monsters Unexplained TV, pretty much wherever you want to go. And then my Instagram is the weird side of normal. If you wanted to specifically go chase me down and ask questions, stuff like that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam, for coming on. Thank you again. Just want to take a few minutes to say thank you to you, all my listeners, for listening to the podcast. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube, making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications, and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast, thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed, share the show with a friend, 
really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's a list. Number one, encounters from Franklin County, Texas. Number two, encounters from the entire state of Iowa. Number three, encounters from Oak Ridge, Oregon or the surrounding area. Number four, any individuals that know about Bigfoot being flown off after the Mount St. Helens eruption. Number five, individuals that have had a Bigfoot encounter while in the military. Number six, those that have had a Bigfoot encounter in the southern New Hampshire or north central Massachusetts area, including Franklin County, Massachusetts. Number seven, individuals that have had a Bigfoot encounter in a Bible camp or Boy Scout camp setting. Number eight, individuals that have had Bigfoot try to enter their house forcibly while they were living inside. Number nine, individuals that have act actively have a Bigfoot living on their property. And lastly, any sightings that are in the Wachita National Forest area of Oklahoma or Arkansas. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it. I'll see you back next time, listeners. New shows on Mondays and Fridays. I'll see you then.